Yeah, time for another constitution. And it, I don't know if that's a full statement or a question, but that's the statement of our show. Uh, here on History is here to help. And Peter Hoffenberg, a history professor, he's here to help us help history. And, um, and Andrea Freeman uh, is here to help help both of us, but especially from a legal point of view. In fact, in that regard, I would like to ask Peter to say hello and also introduce Andrea. Wouldn't that be good? That would be nice. Aloha. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, Professor Freeman, thank you very much for joining us, particularly at the uh, last minute. Let me just briefly introduce you because we're more interested in what you have to say. But uh, Professor Freeman is a full professor at the William Richardson School of Law, which I think you all know is a proud jewel of uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, she has uh, published extensively, uh, currently working on her third book. Uh, she is a returning Fulbright scholar, so much to her own acclaim and also I think UH's acclaim. It's, it's wonderful to have Fulbright scholars here. Uh, we've asked her today uh, to talk about uh, what Jay was tentatively, in his tentative way, articulating as what we might say the constitutional crisis in which we now see ourselves, or at least I think a fair number of people see themselves. So we've asked Dr. Freeman to help us figure out, well, first of all, I mean, is this a crisis or not, right? Sometimes when people say that, it isn't really. And Dr. Freeman not only teaches con law, but has a very profound understanding of how we might rethink the Constitution. So welcome. We're looking forward to your contributions. And Jay, my old friend, take it from here. Okay, Andre, I have a tough question for you. Um, why don't we just leave it alone? <laughs> the Constitution, just leave it as it is. Leave it as it is. Sure. Let us muddle through on what the founders thought was the, you know, the essential technique. I think what we need to keep in mind is that the founders never expected us hundreds of years later to be relying on that document to govern ourselves now, right? They wanted the Constitution to evolve. They, they just even couldn't conceive that we'd still have originalists, you know, we'd have people thinking, well, what were you thinking back then? Because they knew that wouldn't be relevant. Well, we had 27 amendments already, some of them more profound than others. Uh, but, you know, if we if we stop right here and, and maybe wait for a groundswell of interest in other amendments going forward, uh, you know, in other words, do what we've been doing for 230 some you know, um, w would that be okay? I guess we have to ask ourselves, is it working? And I think most people right now would say it's not working, right? So that implies a need for change. Okay, so the answer then is uh, we do need to do something. <laughs> and then, you know, then the question is, and this is raised by um, the article that you guys have seen, Don Frazier in the Hawaii News Network, um, should we use uh, targeted amendments or should we sweep the whole thing out and have a, a Hawaii constant, Hawaii style constitutional convention where nobody knows what's going to happen? <laughs> what do you think? Do you want to jump in or do you want me to keep going? <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think the problems are too fundamental to just keep adding amendments. Because the problem is the Constitution is deliberately vague in the areas that I personally consider most important, which is the individual rights section of the Constitution. We just don't have anything circumscribed, so it's far too open to interpretation. So I'm inclined to scrap the whole thing and start over again with more of a rights-based Constitution, which would be very specific about which rights are granted to the people and then we can go from there okay uh but let me let me ask this and i do want to go through all of those with you but i think at this moment in time we should we should pause for a moment and, and ask about the logistics of doing that uh hawaii constitutional conventions have not you know been terribly um easy um we haven't had one since 1978 um, and, um, you know, query, uh, how would that work on a federal level? It sounds to me like it would be a melee in the fullest sense of the word. Uh, how, how exactly would we scrap it and start fresh? Yeah. All thoughts on that, please. Welcome. 
<laughs> right? With that, that is the challenge because the content of what, that we would end up with, of course, depends on who writes it. And that's the problem we're seeing now, right? That the content of the, the constitution, how it's interpreted is based on who's interpreting it. And that's what we want to avoid. Could you explain for our viewers uh, what you mean by the problem of rights in the current constitution? and what you would envision appreciating Jay's uh, melee and everybody swinging whatever hot dogs they happen to be eating, uh, could you help us figure out what's wrong with rights? Because everybody's always claiming the constitution protects their rights. Mm -hmm. uh, what's wrong with this constitution in that sense? And then how would you, let's, we'll talk about the mechanism some other time. We may have to get Milner in here to talk about political <laughs> battles. But what do you as a scholar think of as the new constitution would protect rights either differently by definition, et cetera. What, yeah. what okay. do you, so what could you put wrong then and what would we be replaced yeah. with? I, I think I know what you're asking. So I'll take a stab at it. So, you know, to go to the heart of probably the most controversial issue right now, Dobbs and, you know, abortion rights. So the problem with the abortion rights is that they are not specifically written into the constitution. They come from what we call the due process clause and one word, which is liberty, and an interpretation that was sort of constitutionally or at least legally questionable when it was made because it did write a lot into something that is only one word right, implying a right of privacy, uh, implying a right to, to uh, intimacy rights, you know, the protection of intimate parts of your life. That's not written anywhere. And that's what the justices now have relied on. And in that sense, they're not wrong. But we do have a belief, as you just said, that the constitution does protect some minimum right, some floor of individual rights, but that they're not written into it, except for things like, you know, a right to free speech, which again is far open to interpretation. So what we need to do is to get from a constitution that is so vague, an interpretation that is relying on how are we gonna define one word? And since it's not defined, we're going to go back and do our own interpretation of history, of tradition, of things that are completely up for grabs in terms of how you want to interpret them, and then say, that's what the Constitution demands. That makes it too vulnerable and susceptible to the political whims of whoever's doing the interpreting. So how would you determine which rights, though, would be embodied in this new revised well, I am not even revised, new constitution. Like, how would you determine whether privacy of the body is going to be a right or not? Right. I mean, one one potential way of looking at it is is the way that some people have approached it now, looking at polls, you know, looking at what we understand to be the general desire of our population, right? We see people are in the majority in favor of those types of rights. And then there are some rights that I think we wouldn't even have to question, a right to shelter, a right to food, you know, certain basics, health, that are not even guaranteed by our constitution, but that every person, just as a matter of human dignity and being alive, deserve. Right, which is an assumption about what is the public good and that housing is a public good. Um, it's fascinating. I don't know, Jay. You think it's fascinating? I think I think it's. Oh, I, I, you know, I think there's uh, and so many my mind things is like great, that. Because as a British historian, right, uh, I'm used to an organic constitution. So you know, one might even propose that we scrap the idea of a single document, and our constitutional future does not rely upon a single document, but takes much more of a, a British or British influenced. I'll just throw that out there because I can I can see the difficulty of the majority sense of rights in 2022 may not be the majority sense of rights in, well, I don't know, with climate change. Let's go to 2050 and see when it all ends anyhow. Um, so I think that, that's fasc fascinating. I mean, what 
what mechanism would you include then for adding rights as we proceed along? Right, well, you suggest you suggest Peter and uh, and and uh, Andrea that um, some of the problems you've identified, and we have many to go, are can be resolved by Congress overnight. Congress could uh, codify uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, co co Congress could straighten out the voting uh, rights. Uh, it could adopt, like the United Nations adopted last month, uh, uh, you know, a, a grand, profound statement that everyone is entitled to a clean environment. Um, it could fix gun control. Um, and so you could take this kind of statute by statute approach, and maybe that's like the British system, um, and clean everything up statute by statute. I think we have problems there, though, because, you know, what we've enshrined in our jurisprudence around the Constitution is that the the courts, the Supreme Court, can say that a law violates the Constitution and is therefore void, right? So even if these things become codified, if challenged, Supreme Court can still strike those laws down and say, no, sorry, it's unconstitutional. So let, let me go to one other oh. thing about this, and, and that is that we know on all the issues I just mentioned that the country is not of the same mind. We have we have a clear divisiveness on, I mean, a hard divisiveness. Uh, I, I, my bubble, your bubble will never agree divisiveness um, on many, many important rights and other issues, including mechanical issues, including legal issues. And so um, if you couldn't get Congress to make those changes, how in the world uh, could we ever get an, an, uh, you know, anybody in this country to come together on fundamental points? Uh, and, and I think, um, you know, it is an impossibility uh, to agree on any of the things that we are divided over. And, and when, when, you, when you have that kind of situation, what you usually have is a remaking of the of the uh, social compact, of the legal comp compact, where the members of a jurisdiction agree that this is the way they will govern themselves. And that is often accompany accompanied by war and bloodshed. Uh, how in the world are we going to get this together? I, I totally agree. We need to get it together. We need to take a, a clean sweep and start from scratch. But doesn't that involve uh, rethinking the social compact and having the the two sides agree by arms? <laughs> is this a call to arms? Is this what's happening right here? <laughs> what is, what is uh, um, and that's a question. Okay. You're not you're not trying to incite a, a revolution. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't have any weapons with nail guns that we're going to fire into offices. Um, let me take a slightly uh, a complementary uh, path, which is recognizing the significance and importance of your overhauling and starting afresh. Uh, let's say, uh, let's talk slightly smaller. I just wanted to get your sense as an expert about what your views are. So. One of the issues is, look, the court is a problem, as you suggest, uh, but it's a problem that could be resolved with a few measures. So I just want to do a, a, a quick, as uh, <clears throat> Senator Graham would say, Arama. Uh, what is your view, for example, of enlarging the court? Yeah, I'm in favor of that. Okay, but that's easy. All right. Uh, what about this notion that um, there should be uh, an age by which one should retire. Absolutely. As a person who, who clerked in, in uh, federal courts for four years and have met many a judge, I think that's a wonderful idea. Okay, as long as it doesn't cover professors. All right, there's no age. Okay. Left I'm okay. perfectly willing to retire. No, you're very young. No, you're very young. <laughs> they, they and I are the AARP members. You're a youngster. Okay, uh, the third one, which... Um, I hadn't really thought of before. The other two are kind of obvious ones, but that uh, each president during a term, regardless of whether somebody passes away or retires, gets to appoint somebody. Does that sound reasonable? Sounds fine to me. I I don't. I, I'm not. I mean, I know you have the big. You have the big macro. Yeah. I really, no, I really appreciate that. I think it's fascinating. Um, as Jay suggests, we should have you come back, though, to talk about that, because that really does involve the social compact and the public good. It's a fascinating topic. And 
So let's kind of hold on to that um, and talk about it. But also, so you you would think that potentially by changes in the Supreme Court, access to numbers, et cetera, some fresh blood, we might in a macro way be able to resolve some of these issues? It might be more balanced. More balanced. But if it doesn't solve some of the big problems. No, no, but I'm, I'm thinking along, look, I mean, your, your claim is a common claim among historians that the only time we've, you know, seriously rethought our constitution seriously, and Linda Colley talks about this in her book, We're Not Alone, is war, right? <laughs> 13th, 14th, and 15th are not there without 700,000 dead Americans. Um, and so while I appreciate the macro <laughs> needs, I also think this is a society, and the world today with globalization is a society where, where order, <laughs> where order is the top priority, right? So how, how are we gonna get reform while making it still feel that people uh, are living in a, a social order. I mean, that yeah, you know, I mean, worries me. I mean, what, today what we I hope, sorry. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I hope we don't need that many people to die to change, right? But I think it's a, sort of a profound insight into what is happening with gun control laws because we are seeing on a, on a just a smaller level, right? People being killed every day because of our refusal to limit gun, to put sure. and, they're, and they're killing right. themselves. I mean, suicide is one of the- Yes, but also children, right? I mean, like, I would think if there's one thing we can all agree on is we do not want to fear when we drop our kids off at school every day that they won't come home because they'll be murdered. Okay, so that leads very easily into uh, a second branch of reform which is the Electoral College. Oh, it leads to the Second Amendment. Right. First, right. it leads to the okay. Second Amendment, Possibly which is then. not well drafted. I mean, what kind of a grade would you give to one of your students who drafted the Second Amendment as it is written? I mean, the language has changed. The standard of drafting has changed. The way we speak to each other has changed. The Constitution could be improved all across the board by you know, updating the quality of the language. Okay, so that that's the solution. We'll, 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 get, a grammar, we'll get a grammar. I wouldn't give a very good grade to the people that have interpreted it the way that they have now. Instead of a Senate parliamentarian, we'll get a Senate grammarian. Okay, that's okay. All right, <laughs> that'll be the takeaway for today. We'll call it the DC comma, not the Oxford comma. Um, but as you, as you know, because of your research and your reading, et cetera, uh, among the major issues is what to do with this electoral college. And that, to a certain degree, is connected to guns, right? Because the states with the disproportionate amount of power <laughs> electoral with the electoral college are really the place that's much more likely to allow folks to walk around. So what is your thought as a constitutional expert about what seems to be an atavism, but certain people still like the filibuster hold on to it? What, What's your view about if we should do anything about the electoral college? Yeah, I mean, these are, are vestiges of enslavement, right? And so I think we need to just kind of purge the Constitution of anything that was a result of compromises made for certain states to preserve their economy, you know, and to, to try to, to keep the power that they had through enslaving people. So you know, for, one of the things, one of the things that uh, is in that article um, um, in Hawaii News, uh, Hawaii, uh, uh, what is it, News Network, um, is is this whole notion, and it was it was a, a fundamental problem at the beginning of the country, is uh, what what extent did the rights of the majority uh, trump, and I hate to use that word, uh, the rights of the minority, and we're still we're still playing with that, and in fact, the rights of the minority seem to be alive and well even in the face of the rights of the majority. Um, and I guess the question I would ask you on that regard, Andrea, you know, can we get rid of this thing with the rights of the minority? Um, if you are in the majority, you should run the country. That's the way it is. And if you want to run the country, then get into the majority. But, but you can't have the rights of the minority um, twisting the rights of the majority. And that's exactly the flaw that Trump has been playing with and McConnell uh, since the beginning of their terms. 
But this is the problem because it really depends on how you define majority and minority, right? Because when, when I think about minority, one of the groups that I might think about is trans individuals, right? Transgender. So they're in a minority, they need their rights protected. The majority would not like to protect those rights. So there are some situations where we cannot shut people out because they're in the minority, right? We need to have ways to preserve. The problem is when the minority that's controlling is not the minority you identify with or agree with, then it, it looks like more of a problem. So, I think the other, yeah, the other issue I think is when we talk about rights is we have this uh, zero sum game mentality, right? That if I give you a right, Right. I'm taking a right for myself. I think that's a, real, a that's, a real exis, that's a real existential problem. And I do blame in part the founding parents for that. Uh, the notion that they're, uh, I need to sacrifice. Some. Now, they would have agreed because that's the nature of a social contract. But it seems to me that's become free. These are my rights. You have no, you have no rights. Um, my rights mean, okay, I'm taking rights from you. Uh, and it's been work done by this more on the philosophical line. And it may be in keeping with your new constitution that we need to rethink the notion of rights so it's not a zero sum game. So like the majority, the majority who may not want to provide rights for transsexuals need to understand- Trans Transgender can, people. Transgender, I'm sorry, for transgender, I apologize. Mm -hmm. uh, we can understand that in granting and protecting that community, they are, in fact, <laughs> protecting their own. Mm -hmm. That's what worries me in a social frame, that it's my rights to hell with yours. And you know what? I know I'm depriving you of rights, but it's my right to deprive you of rights. Yeah. I, I think we're conflating rights and power. You can talk oh, about the, the trans, and that's certainly a matter of rights, you know, individual rights. Uh, it, it, as we have known them, constitutional rights, right, rights for the person. Um, but the rights that, that I think we're to focus on, uh, which control everything, is 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 the the decision making uh, rights, the decision making yeah. power, uh, the electoral college, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so forth. Can can you talk about that? Well, one thing I think we should mention when we're talking about those kinds of rights and power is how the court very early on in this Marbury versus Madison case that is you know, considered fundamental to constitutional law, it's, it's taught in the first class of constitutional law in almost every case, situated the ultimate power to interpret the constitution in the Supreme Court. But it did not have to be that way, right? That power and that decision-making could be shared among the branches. So I think that's a reform that that we should bring up and we should think about because then we have the you know the good parts of saying okay we need a branch that's not political even though as we can see now that is not the judiciary right the judiciary is very politicized right now but ideally it is not to balance some of the representation of minority interests such as what I brought up and what you've you know, distinguished, but we also want to think about, Peter, as you said, the majority, you know, that, that the majority should have some power, and there we're looking at the legislative branch, and then we also want to look at the executive branch and say, you know, we have not just a president, but we have all these agencies who are actually running almost everything in the country, and so have a lot of insights into how things should be run. And why can't we have more of a balance between those three branches instead of situating it in these nine individuals? So how would you see, that's very important. I mean, separation of powers yet working together, et cetera. So I mean, one argument is that basically since Congress can't do anything by default, right? Almost by default, it's gone to the courts. How would you see that uh, in the last couple of minutes working out practically? Because as you say, Marbury versus Madison is the first year and kindergarten to first grade and separation of powers, et cetera. So how would you see that in your new constitution playing out? Yeah, okay, so now you're back to mechanics. So I think we're, that's, 
<laughs> That's a different conversation. I, I'm going to say fair you can take broader the principles you can take and the ideals. Fit, yeah. but, that, but that's where it always winds up. Right. It well, always winds up, as Peter said at the outset, this is a crisis. Because the existing constitution, I totally agree, is not working. And people can drive trucks through it. Uh, and, and, and the country is suffering mightily over it. Um, but there's no easy solution to amend it, to, to change the fundamental points. The, the two senators per state is, is baked in. It's very hard to amend that. Um, and, it, and for that for that matter, amendments are hard, especially when you have a, you know, a divided country. Uh, so we, we always come back to the fact that this is a crisis. The country is in a crisis. And, and there's no easy way to get out of the crisis. And, and, you know, the conversation about what parts are working and what parts are not working and how you would change them is, is may I say, may I say this, Andrea? It's almost futile. <laughs> I mean, F-U-T-I-L-E -F rather than, than both Peter's both. definition both. of futile. Or maybe both. It is maybe both. both. <laughs> it is very much, very much. But we just have a different kind of aristocracy. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, Andrea, what would you like to leave? We have a, a minute or two. What would you like to leave the audience thinking about? And we are definitely going to have you come back. And maybe we'll get you together with Milner and Navi, and we can have a nice chat about what a different constitution would look like. But what would you like to be the takeaway for our thousands of listeners? I just want everyone to understand that when, when the justices say, this is written in the constitution, this is here, they're usually lying. So <laughs> maybe take a look at it yourself, you know, Very and tell the words and, and understand okay. that you have just as much uh, insight into what it might mean as they do. Okay, that's a wonderful way to end up. Thank you, Jay. Uh, thank, thank you, Peter. Professor Freeman, very much. Last I minute. think we've, we've learned really today, as we have learned before on similar shows with Peter and me and others. Uh, is that the country is very complex, much more complex than uh, the founders thought. Uh, how could they know? Um, and it is getting more complex on a social and legal level. And, and to address all the issues that come down the pike is really a chore. And um, I, we have to get our act together if we, if we are to survive. And so, uh, Andrea, you and your students and the people who might participate in rewriting certain provisions or in creating a convention over it uh, are ultimately going to be uh, among the most important people uh, to save us, all of us. Uh, thank you, Peter. Peter Hoffenberg, history professor, Andrea Freeman, a constitutional law professor. Uh, great discussion, but it is only in a very complex world, the only, the very beginning. I hope you agree. I know you agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.